cars to clear his brains But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles And every knee will bow before him Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, the queen before the King. Set the captives free But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world Hey there, welcome to CCC's online service. I'm Lisa and I'm really glad you're here today. And I hope this time together is the highlight of your week. We're continuing the Recalibrate series today because we've been focusing on recalibrating our minds and how we think. Because the truth is our entire lives flow from the stream of thoughts that just bounce around in our heads all day. And that's partly why CCC's issued the 52 challenge, 52 verses in 52 weeks. It's a way for us to get these verses from the Bible into our hearts and our lives and allow them to renew our minds. So I've started the challenge and I'm a little bit surprised at how much I've been looking forward to it each Monday. I mean, I've gotten to the point now where I'm trying to guess what the verse might be before the text comes in. And then once I get it, my next challenge is to see if I can memorize it that day. And that's just looked a lot of different ways for me. I'm talking about it, writing it down, trying to understand what it means, and then figuring out what that looks like for me. My husband's also been enjoying the challenge and we end up talking about it all throughout the week. But he said something to me the other day. He said, you know, this has been life-giving and I couldn't agree more. I mean, I thought, man, you know what? He's right. What a great way to think about it. Intentionally focusing on God and his words, one verse at a time, has really been life-giving. And that's why I really hope you'll jump in and take the challenge. Now's a great time to sign up. Just text 52 to 410-849-6265 or go to communitycc.net and click the 52 challenge button. CCC will send a text or an email each Monday. 
Hey, and while you're there on the website, go ahead and fill out that CCC card. It's also found in the chat. Be sure and include any prayer requests or questions you might have. We'd love to support you however we can. We're also going to celebrate communion just a little later in service. So now's a great time to grab some bread and juice just so you can be ready for that part of service. Again, thanks so much for tuning in today. And I really hope this service is a chance for you to turn your attention towards God and set your mind on things above. And as you focus on Him, I hope it helps you take steps towards more fully experiencing Him in your own life. You are good, you are good When there's nothing good in me You are love, you are love On display for all to see You are light, you are light When the darkness closes in You are hope, you are hope you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are Death has lost its sting. Hey, no, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. A light of the world. Yeah.
We're going to celebrate communion now, and this is something that we do each week to help us remember. All throughout the Bible, we see God using ceremonies, symbols, and stories to help us remember what's important. And Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of Him. So we take the bread as a reminder of His body that was given for us, and the juice to remember His blood that was poured out. Let's use this time to remember Jesus' sacrifice, and because He gave Himself up for us, we can be forgiven and connected with God. That's why our hope is in Jesus, and that's why we remember what He's done for us. I'll pray for us. Father God, thank you for your Son, Jesus, and for your great love for us. Thank you for making the way through Jesus for us to be intimately connected with you. May we never forget what it cost you. We thank you for your love and compassion, your mercy and your peace. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Well, hey, everybody, so glad that you've tuned in today. I really believe there's no better investment of your time than when you're checking out the things of God. My name's Joe Wilson, and I'm one of the pastors at CCC. And today we're wrapping up a teaching series that we're in called Recalibrate. Now, next week, we're kicking off a brand new series that I know you're gonna love, but today we close out this idea of what it means to recalibrate our minds and lives. Now, when you say recalibration, it kind of assumes that you were actually calibrated at some point that when you came off the factory floor, so to speak, you had certain presets. And these presets had you wired in such a way that you were really open to the things of God. You were born with a natural curiosity about Him. The first time you marveled at a sunrise or sunset, you were wired to think of Him. Your original calibration had you positively disposed to God. You wanted to know Him, and you wanted to know what He's like, and, and maybe what it was like to live in relationship with Him. But here's what happens to us as we grow through life. Lots of things kind of knock us out of spiritual alignment. Difficulties, obstacles, distractions. And before we know it, we have this constant pull away from the things of God. And here's the deal. Life doesn't make much sense when you're not seeing God in the picture. So we've been talking about recalibrating. How do we get back into that place where we see the world through the lens of a God who made us and loves us? And I wanna tell you the key to recalibration. 
And that's allowing the Bible to take up more space in your mind. More than anything else, this has the ability to change the very trajectory of your life. The things that trip you up, that make life frustrating, can be changed completely by the way you allow God's words to influence you. Now, I just can't overstate this. This matters because the tone of your life hangs in the balance. Now, I love this verse in the Bible that says, your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. Notice, the way that God has revealed himself in the Bible, that's my heritage, that's your heritage. That's the wisdom we were always meant to have and live under. And the result is that it can be a great source of joy. The Bible is my heritage. It can bring me great joy when I know it. If I don't know it, if I'm not familiar with what God's promised, I'll expose myself to all kinds of unnecessary worry and fear, anger, unresolved bitterness. And I'll carry all this negative stuff around when I don't have the perspective that comes from God. That's why it's important to have a knowledge of His Word, to even memorize it when we can. Now, for whatever reason, I seem to be able to remember all sorts of things without even trying. But things I want to remember, I struggle with. I've often thought, if I could remember Bible verses like I remember song lyrics, I'd be golden. Are you that way? I can remember being a kid trying to remember all the words to Hot Rod Lincoln. I didn't know what half of them meant. And it probably looked weird to have a six-year-old saying, my pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that Hot Rod Lincoln. But I thought the song sounded cool, and I liked knowing the lyrics. When the movie Braveheart came out, I watched it a lot. It's hands down the movie I've seen the most in the theater. Remember when we used to go to the theater? I've seen that movie like at least 25 times, at least five times in the theater, probably more. I started to know the dialogue as well as the actors. You get the point. I can remember song lyrics and movie lines, but then I trip up on the 23rd Psalm, which promises me the presence of God in my darkest moments. And that's probably a little bit more important than the lyrics to the Beatles' Yellow Submarine. Now, why am I bothering with this? Why is this even important? Why am I even worried about remembering what the Bible says? Because I want to live a life that matters. I want to live a life that allows me to know God fully and to be fully known by Him. I want to live an effective life. I don't want to just take up space and time and use up resources and die. I want my life to matter. And the way I know what's important is by knowing God's Word. But we've got this problem. There's something that gets in the way of that. There's competition for our attention. We have a spiritual enemy that tempts us to make a life just this selfish endeavor, my wants and my desires and my greeds. And our spiritual enemy is attacking the one place that controls us, our minds. You see, there's a battle waging in your life, my life, right now. And that battleground is our mind. When you watch a lot of football, you'll hear commentators and coaches say one thing over and over again. Now, to those of us who are untrained folks, when we watch football, we probably just watch where the ball is, where it's flying, who's running with it. But coaches and the pros will tell you that the game is won or lost on the line of scrimmage. The team that best controls that line, whether offense or defense, is the team that's going to win the game more times than not. Well, your mind is the line of scrimmage that will determine your effectiveness in this life. It is a battleground. And the Bible told us it was going to be this way. Notice this verse. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war, war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I don't know what your toolbox looks like, but you know, I've determined that you can fix about 80% of all home repairs with one of two tools, duct tape and WD-40. Do you have something that's broken? Duct tape. Something needs mended or bonded? Duct tape. You have something that's stuck and needs loosened? WD-40. See how helpful church can be? I just saved you a lot of heartache with that little bit of information. But there are occasions when you need something different than duct tape and WD-40. 
For instance, if you've raised children or if you've owned a dog, at some point or another, you've probably had to repair a screen, a screen door or a window screen. Anybody ever done that? Now, if you've ever had the screen knocked out and then you try to fix that screen, there is a special tool they make to help you do that job. Do you know what that's called? No, you don't. Nobody knows what that tool is called. It's the wheelie thing, right? You've got a little wheel on one end, a little wheel on the other end. Do you want the actual name of this tool? It's actually called the screen door rolling tool. Now, I feel like this is one of those things that ought to have a real name. Maybe an Ikea sounding name like the Xtorp, or maybe a Harry Potter sounding name like Patronus. Hand me the Patronus, I need to fix that screen. Now, if you don't have the screen door rolling tool, you're gonna be really frustrated trying to do that job without it. Well, the Bible says, you don't take a knife to a gunfight, and you don't take a gun to a spiritual battle. The Apostle Paul, inspired by God's Spirit, writes, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. When I'm faced with anger, rage, bitterness, fear, worry, uncertainty, lust, greed, selfishness, I need divine power to break down strongholds. And what brings divine power to our lives? the Bible. Now, it says here that it breaks strongholds. What's a stronghold? Well, you know, right? That thing you can't seem to shake, that temptation you always give into, that way of thinking that always puts you in a place of helplessness, patterns of thinking and behavior that are paralyzing and defeating. And those strongholds exist in the mind. The spiritual battle for your life is a battle that exists internally. Where are our biggest mistakes born? They're born in our mind. Our sins all begin in the mind. Notice these words from James chapter one. Each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it's full grown gives birth to death. Notice that there's this gestational cycle to our sin. It gets conceived. Desire grows, and that leads us to behaviors that take us away from God and towards death, ultimately. Now, we see this illustrated for us the very first time that people reject God's leadership. Adam and Eve are walking in the garden on earth, a place of beauty that God had created for them, and they're tempted to eat the fruit of the tree that God has forbidden, but they're enticed. And notice this verse from the very first book of the Bible. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for getting wisdom, she took some and ate it. Now, we can learn a lot here. She looked at the fruit, and it was desirable. She wanted it. And so she began to reason. Maybe God doesn't really mean what he said about not eating this fruit. Maybe it's not that big of a deal. I mean, after all, how can something that looks so good be so bad? Plus, that serpent said, if we eat this, we're going to know things that God knows. I wonder why God is keeping that stuff from us. Why would he do that? Feels like he's keeping something good from us. You know, God must not be very good if he's going to keep something good from me. I don't think I can trust a God like that. I think I know what's best for me. And what's best for me is this thing that I want. I need it. I'm going to have it. And just like that, a thought becomes a desire and it begins to grow. And when it's fully grown, it gives birth to sin and death. The line of scrimmage for the effectiveness of your life is in your mind. The battle for your heart and soul is won and lost there. And when we saturate our minds with the Bible, it has divine power to break down strongholds. Now, let me show you how this works. It's a very predictable process. When you continue to pour the Bible into your mind, you can expect these kind of outcomes. First comes knowledge. You pour the Bible into your life and you just start to learn things. Now, if you hang out at church very long, you're going to pick up some stuff just by osmosis, but your knowledge of God is going to be limited. Have you ever listened to a sermon one week, maybe heard David preaching and you thought, man, I've never heard that story before. I need to read that. I remember one time I was in college and this guy was preaching at our school's chapel service and he started talking about a guy in the Bible named Zerubbabel. And I thought, I've never heard of that guy. I mean, he sounds like a Flintstones character. I need to find out who that is. 
Now, I don't want to chase a rabbit here and talk about Zerubbabel, but that sermon may be interested in what was going on in the later part of the Old Testament. When you start to read the Bible, you just start becoming familiar with things. You learn the basic facts. You learn who the characters are. You learn why their lives are important enough to get written about. You learn about God and what he's up to. Now, this isn't just about learning facts. This is about learning the heart of God. You see, it's possible to know a lot of facts about the Bible and miss the heart of God. Jesus accused some religious teachers of that very thing in Mark chapter 12. They were creating some elaborate arguments and pontificating on what they thought God would do in certain scenarios. And Jesus says to them, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? Man, I wonder how many times Jesus <laughs> wants to say that to me. Just knowing what the Bible reveals about God gives me a great head start in living effectively. But here's what happens. The more we pour the Bible into our minds and it gives us knowledge, it leads us to perspective. It's what the Bible calls in other places wisdom. You not only know the things of God, but you begin to look at life from his perspective. In knowledge, you want to know the Bible. In perspective, you begin to have the heart and the mind of God. And when I begin to have the mind of God, it affects how I see the world around me. Notice again how the Apostle Paul words this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. You know, most of us go through life viewing other people as bit players in the story of our lives. We're the star and they're the extras. We can have a really selfish point of view. But God's perspective helps us to see that life isn't my story. It's really God's story. And Jesus Christ is the star of the show. And we view everyone else in light of him. And when I see people that way, I'll treat them differently. When I see that life isn't all about me, it changes how I face success, failure, even how I define those things. I begin to see that people who don't know this God of the Bible, well, there's a limit on how good life is going to be for them if they don't get to know him. In fact, I need to spend a significant amount of my life helping other people find their way back to him. Perspective changes how I live and it gives me a why for life. Now, there's a third outcome that occurs when I pour the Bible into my mind. Knowledge, perspective, and then conviction. We develop these godly convictions. For instance, what does God think about human life? When I understand that, I begin to develop convictions about it, that life isn't cheap or common, that everyone's created in his image. What does God think about temptation? What does he think about sin, even specific sins? Well, I begin to develop convictions around those perspectives. Now, convictions are not the same as opinions. Opinions come a dime a dozen. And it's amazing how much people will fight over their opinions. How many of you know someone who's extremely opinionated? If you're with them in the room, don't look at them. We all know people like that. But there are some people who just believe their opinion is always right. And they're experts on everything from bathing the baby to asphalting the driveway. Spend 15 minutes on the social media outlet of your choice and you'll see how passionate people can get about things that really don't matter or how strongly they can argue for a point of view that's based on nothing more than just their feelings. But you see, convictions aren't based on feelings. They're based on the truth of the Bible. That's how I can obey God even when I don't feel like it. For instance, you're probably aware that God has teaching in the Bible about sexual ethics. They aren't lengthy chapters, but they seem to be pretty clear. And I want you to notice how this works. If I don't have knowledge of God's teaching on sexual ethics, I won't make wise choices about sex. I'll end up having a lot of pain associated with that part of my life. But knowledge isn't enough. If I only have knowledge, but I don't have perspective, I'll think what the Bible says about sex is just silly, unsophisticated, antiquated ideas. I won't understand why those teachings are there. But if I have knowledge of what God says and the perspective of why he says it, I'm going to develop convictions around that. So God says that I'm to be faithful to my wife, that I'm to reserve for her the most intimate places of my heart and body. Now, one of the reasons I'm to do that is because marriage is a metaphor that God has given us to represent his faithfulness to his people. 
Another reason is that he understands how we're built emotionally. He knows that he's built us for a monogamous marriage relationship that thrives in full commitment. So when I'm tempted, when you're tempted, it's not about an opinion. It's not even about how I feel in that moment. My conviction transcends that because I understand the mind and heart of God. And that process happens every time you read something in the Bible. You learn it, you gather God's perspective, and you develop convictions. When I read the Bible, I come to know that I'm not supposed to lie. Lying is offensive to God. But let's be honest, lying can be tempting, right? I don't always feel like telling the truth. One time I was working at home on my day off, and I was into some kind of project. I don't even remember what it was. It might have been painting. And I got a phone call. Joe, the church is locked and, and we're waiting. Are you coming? And it hit me. I was missing a wedding that I was supposed to perform. I said, I'll be right there. I took the fastest shower in the history of mankind, threw on a suit, drove to church, and in that three-mile drive, I thought of at least 25 lies I could tell to explain why I hadn't been there on time. It's not always convenient to tell the truth. But for followers of Jesus, the knowledge that lying is a sin leads to the perspective that God is truth, and in Him there's no falsehood. So those who follow Him are called to reflect that. And that leads to a conviction that we're going to be people who tell the truth. As we develop godly convictions, our hearts begin to reflect the heart of God. We don't only want to see what God sees, but we want to feel what He feels about the world, about His Word, about His church. Friends, our world is brimming with opinions founded in nothing more than feelings, and those are going to change like the wind. Our convictions are grounded in the Word of God, and they give us direction for living. Okay, one more step in the progression, one more outcome of filling our minds with the Bible. We get knowledge, perspective, conviction, and that leads to character. Once we begin to develop, to develop our convictions, we start acting on those convictions. And the sum total of actions based on conviction is something we call character. We learn the things that please God. We understand why they're important to Him, and we decide in our heart to live in a way that reflects those traits. And as we let those flow out of our lives over time, we develop a character. And what happens is that you start having God's perspective so ingrained in your life that it just becomes second nature for you to respond to live in godly ways. Now, you're not going to be perfect. Nobody is. But you will find that God's Spirit quickens inside of you as you let His Word dwell richly in you. But character is about consistency, and consistency is maintained as we continually fill our minds with God's truth. Now, here's the deal. This whole thing starts in the mind. Do you remember a guy by the name of Payne Stewart? Payne Stewart was a professional golfer. On October 25th, 1999, he boarded a Learjet in Orlando, Florida with five friends on his way to a golf tournament in Texas. The plane took off without any incident. After 13 minutes into the flight, they were cruising at 25,000 feet of altitude. An air traffic controller came out over the radio and said, you're cleared to go to 39,000 feet. No response. Silence. The instruction was repeated again. Nothing back. After several minutes of trying to reestablish radio communication, some Air Force F-16s were scrambled to try to see if they could get up in the air and find out what was going on with this Learjet. A couple of these pilots were flying as close as 50 feet away from that Learjet, looking inside to see if they could see any movement, any life, anybody. But you see, what had happened is the cabin had lost pressure, and the two pilots and the passengers had gone unconscious and then died from a lack of oxygen in minutes. But for the next four hours, that Learjet flew on autopilot, flew 1,500 miles off course until it finally ran out of fuel and crashed into a farm field outside of Mena, South Dakota, going 600 miles an hour. Now, if you'd have been standing on the ground that day, you'd have seen that jet fly by. You'd have seen a beautiful jet flying high and flying fast. And on the outside, everything would look great. Little would you have known that on the inside, something was desperately wrong. That plane was headed for a crash. Some of us, if we look at a casual glance, it seems like they have life totally figured out. On the outside, everything looks good. Good job, nice car, nice neighborhood. 
But inside, off course. Something is horribly wrong. You're in desperate need of a course correction. And if something doesn't change, you're going to crash. And the way to recalibrate is in the battle for your mind. Let God have his way in your thought life. Fill your life with God's word. Take that 52 challenge. It's such an easy step to take. Low risk, high reward. There's no cost. There's no pop quiz at the end. But when you sign up for this, you'll either get a text or an email with a short snippet from the Bible once a week for a year. And now if you read those verses, dwell on them. Read them multiple times in the week. Try to memorize them. You'll develop a deeper love for God and a hunger to know Him even more. Marinate in God's Word and you'll come to know it better. And it'll change your perspective and help you form godly convictions. And it'll develop your character. And friends, as that happens, that's a life worth living. Let's pray about this. Father in heaven, you know, there are just times in life when things don't make a lot of sense. And usually that means we just need more of you in our lives. I pray today that you'd give us self-awareness when we're drifting so that we can recalibrate and we can get our mind and our heart right with yours. Give us courage to take those steps. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for engaging from home today. I hope this online service was helpful and encouraging. And if you'd like to contribute towards helping people find the way back to God here at CCC, you can text CCC White Marsh to 77977 or go to communitycc.net and use the Give tab. And while you're there, you can opt into that 52 challenge. I really hope you're going to go for it. There's also a brand new series kicking off next week called What on Earth Are We Here For? And this series is going to lead us right up to our 15th anniversary birthday. That's the first week in March. And remember, there's a new online starter group kicking up that goes along with this new series. It's just a great way to connect and meet some folks. I hope you'll check that out. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks again for tuning in.